So as we've been embracing vision for 2023, we've sensed God impressing on our hearts that it's the work we've done faithfully, not the results we've achieved successfully that God rewards and and values most. And we've reflected over the last few weeks on the words from the New Testament book of Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10, which says, for God is not unjust, he will not forget how hard you have worked for him. That's why Jesus describes us being ushered into heaven with the words, well done, good and faithful servant instead of well done, good and successful saint. It's not how many things you succeeded at. It's simply how faithful you were in working as best you could for the glory of his name. And the word faithful in this context that we spoke about comes from the Greek meaning trustworthy and believing. And we reflected on the words of Jesus when he spoke about what it means to be trustworthy and believing from Luke's gospel, chapter 7, 23, when he says, the blessing of heaven comes upon those who never lose their faith in me, no matter what happens. Those that are believing and trustworthy, no matter what happens, the blessing of heaven comes upon them. And we discussed how that means when we're faithful, believing and trustworthy, we don't need to chase God's blessings because his blessings chase us. As Jesus said, they come upon us. And we reinforce this truth by articulating that the successes we celebrate tomorrow are then determined by our faithfulness in sowing seed as his servants today. And that means that we don't judge each day by the harvest we reap, but by the seeds that we sow. And therefore, we've spoken about how our vision this year is believing God for a visible harvest produced by our sowing as faithful servants. And Paul the Apostle described how the faithful Abraham of the New Testament grew in his faith. And we too are going to focus this year on growing in our faithfulness, sowing seed as faithful servants. And when we talk about sowing seed as faithful servants, that means whatever we give to God, God from our time, talents, and treasure. Sowing seed as a faithful servant is all about what you give to God from your time, your talents, your treasure, the life you live. And um, I'm lost now, and I don't know where I am. Yes, I'm at the end, time, talents, and treasure. So that's just the recap. Now, Jesus words are recorded in Mark's gospel, chapter 4, verse 26. And he speaks a little more into this dynamic of sowing and reaping, the idea of seed and harvest. And he says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. He goes and he sows, scatters um, seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know about, he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain first, then the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Jesus speaks about someone who is sowing and describes how they sow and then they wait and watch the harvest grow from what they have sown. And that's because Paul the Apostle told us in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 6 that um, that he planted seed, Apollos watered it, but only God could make it grow. That's why Jesus describes the sower as sowing and then waiting and watching it grow so that he could harvest We see Jesus describe the start of sowing seed, then the period of the seed's growth as it sprouts, and then the harvest that comes. And it's interesting to note that in the process of seed being sown and starting to grow, Jesus describes how the sower does not know how the seed grows. It says in verse 27, night and day, whether he sleeps the sower or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. The reason we do not know how the seed we've sown grows is because it's God who works with the seed we've sown, not us. And as God describes in Isaiah 55 verse 8, his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. You see, the period between our sowing and the harvest that we desire to reap is often a struggle because we don't have control because we can't grow the seed and we don't know how. I just don't know how, God. 
God, God, I've taken the seed. You told me I must be a faithful servant. I've sown God, and I'm sitting here waiting. And God, I don't know how. Are you going to take that little bit of seed I'm sowing in this soil and somehow give me the harvest that I've been praying and trusting for? I just don't know how. God, I know how to sow the seed. I know how to harvest the, the, the abundance of your provision. I don't know how you work in your ways and your thoughts to ensure that the seed grows into the harvest I've been trusting for. Waiting isn't easy because we don't see how God works in our ways while waiting for the harvest in his time for the seed that we've sown. The ways God works don't make sense to our human understanding and how God thinks about time doesn't correlate to our human boundaries and and this makes waiting hard. God, where is it? God, like, I don't know how the seeds I've sown are gonna bear the kind of provision I need in a harvest. I can't see it, God. I don't know how. This is difficult, God. God. I was waiting for you and I expected it at this time in this way and it hasn't shown up. Should I be looking somewhere else for spiritual success, God, or remaining faithful in sowing seed even though I'm struggling because waiting isn't easy. In fact, the psalmist writes of a similar struggle in the waiting from the Old Testament book of Psalm 69 verse 3 when he says these words, I am exhausted from crying for help. My throat is parched. My eyes are swollen with weeping, waiting for my God to help me. So many of us have been sowing and now we're sitting, weeping, waiting for God to bring the harvest we're trusting for. We're here and we're going, God, I've been waiting so long for that harvest. You see, the harvest you're trusting God for may seem so out of reach because of how long you've seemed to wait. You may be like the psalmist described, feeling so exhausted from waiting that you feel compelled to do God's job of growing the seed your way and forcing a harvest in the timing you choose. God, it's not happening. I've waited so long. God, I can't Well, I'm compelled. I remember when I was a kid, I thought you planted seeds. And then like in the cartoons, when you watered them, it grew. And then I'd water them and wait. I don't know how these are gonna grow. And they weren't growing in my timing. And I was getting bored and frustrated. So as a kid, I thought, well, let me dig back under the ground, take the seeds and try and plant them somewhere else. The harvest you're trusting God for may seem so out of reach because of how long you've seemed to wait. The struggles may be so great, it doesn't even seem like the seed would possibly grow into a harvest from the place in which you found yourself. And it may leave you feeling compelled to do God's job in growing the seed your way and forcing a harvest in the timing you choose. But Ecclesiastes chapter 3, 11 from the Old Testament tells us that he has made everything beautiful in its time. God's thoughts on time are not yours. And his ways of working can't be reasoned with human understanding. Just as Jesus said, and we had read earlier from Mark chapter 4, 27. Night and day, whether he, the sower, sleeps and gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. I don't know how. It's most frustrating when we feel we don't have control and don't know why or how things are going to work. God, I don't know how you're working and producing the harvest of provision that I'm waiting for because I thought you would do it my way in my time. Once you've sown, your job is to patiently wait while God works because you don't know how. This waiting is not passive. Oh, well, now I've sown. Oh, no, I'll just wait you, eh? Oh, yo, it's been a long time, whatever. If you really cared about me, you would have done it by now. No, I'm not talking about that kind of waiting. When we wait on God, we're talking about an act of trust placed in God whose thoughts and ways are greater than ours, meaning we remain in hopeful expectation. 
meaning we go, I've sown my seed. I don't know how you're gonna work this out in my struggle or circumstances, but God, I place my trust in your sovereignty that goes beyond what I could understand. And in that, I wait with an expectant hope. You see, the greatest danger to the harvest we've planted is our impatience with God's timing in growing the seed his way and not ours. Leadership expert and author Jim Ron said, the twin killers of success are impatience and greed. Let's apply that to the spiritual principle of faithfulness with seed. You see, when we exchange God's timing for ours, what should be Beautiful in his time, as described in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, can actually become a burden and lead to unnecessary brokenness. In the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, we read of the negative impact of impatience for the fulfillment of God's promises in our lives. Now, the context of this verse is that there was a a king named Saul who reigned over God's people, the Israelites. And during this period in history, God would speak to his people through a specific person for a specific purpose. We didn't have Christ who came to, to, to allow the spirit that raised Christ from the dead to live in each one of us. The spirit came upon people specifically. And God had given this ability to speak on his behalf to a man called Samuel the priest. Samuel had given King Saul instructions from God that before engaging in a particular war, he he and the Israelite army were to remain where they were, waiting until Samuel returned from a trip to make a sacrificial offering. But even after God had given Saul this clear command to wait, he started feeling mounting pressure because of his circumstances. And his impatience got the better of him. It tells us that after Samuel's instruction that Saul should wait for his return, that Saul remained at Gilgal and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. So God's given them a word to wait on him. There's a war and an enemy before them. And initially they respond by waiting where they are, but they're quaking in fear. When we seek the breakthrough of harvest but are surrounded by the enemy, we may fear that our seed won't produce the things we need. You may find yourself here going, I'm sowing faithfully like a servant, but God, I'm starting to get really afraid that you're not going to produce the harvest I need with the seed. When I look at my circumstances, the things surrounding me, a little like Saul and his men. See, Saul and his men needed victory over the enemy, but they were quaking in fear instead of putting their faith in God's word spoken by Samuel in which God said, wait. It goes on and says, Saul waited seven days the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. Samuel didn't come. He said seven days. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Whoa. You see, at first things seemed clear to Saul. Samuel would return after seven days, but when things didn't go according to Saul's understanding of the timeline, he took matters into his own hands. He sacrificed the burnt offerings to God, which only a priest like Samuel was allowed to do. And so it tells us that when Samuel didn't come in the time that had originally been set, that Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up a burnt offering. Just as he had finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? Asked Samuel. What have you done? Now listen to Saul's reasons for not waiting for God's high priest Samuel to make the offering before they went to war. Listen to his reason for forcing things in his time and his way rather than waiting on God. This is what he says. Saul replied, when I saw um, that the men were scattering and that you had not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling in Michmash, I thought now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Saul said, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set 
time I felt compelled to do something. It's in moments where we've been waiting and we begin to see the enemy or circumstances that become overwhelming or we start to suffer in a certain season. It's when we're waiting and called to be faithful sowers of seed, but we experience these things. When we see something that causes struggle in our lives, then suddenly we can become overwhelmed and feel compelled to, to, to go back into the soil and take the seeds we've sown and force them to grow our way in our time. When we've been waiting, sowing seed, and nothing comes to fruition in our set time, we can then begin to begin to struggle and want to take things into our own hands and try and grow what we do not know. You see, what Saul saw made him feel justified in forcing his way instead of surrendering to God's. What Saul assumed about the set time made him feel justified in speeding up the process instead of waiting on God's sovereign timing. Saul was more worried about the outcome of the war than obedience to God when God said, wait. Saul burnt offerings to God in his way because he was seeking something for himself, God's favor, instead of sacrificing to God's glory. Saul said, I want to win the war. And if I want to win the war, I need to go. But God said, wait. And so, God, I'm going to sow the seed, but I expect you to give me what I think I need. And if you don't do that, then I will give me what I think I need and stop waiting. Do we treat God like a vending machine? God, I've so faithfully sown and you just leave me suffering. I've waited so long. The struggle's getting more and more pressurized. Where are you? I quit and I'll go and find new soil in order to try and make my own success. You see, the way in which we wait on God when life doesn't make sense, reveals the condition of our hearts, who we truly trust. And when it comes to sowing seed, God's timing tests our motives. Are we sowing in obedience? Are we sowing because there's an outcome we want? And when we don't get the outcome we want, We try to produce it and strive in our own strength for success. Do we, like Saul, sow seed purely for the outcomes we receive, or do we sow in obedience to our king, trusting him regardless of the outcomes? I don't know why this is happening, God. I don't know why I seem to be suffering and under such pressure in the very place I'm sowing faithfully. But God, I'm not doing this because I expect you to give me what I want I will continue obeying you because you know that you will give me what I need. It's interesting that after Saul failed to wait on God's timing as documented in that scripture we read, that he would then lose his legacy as the king of Israel and be replaced by David, who unlike Saul was described as a man after God's own heart. And whose words were famously documented in Psalm chapter 139 when he prays, search me, God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there will be any wicked way in me and then lead me in the way everlasting. The way we wait between the sowing season and the harvest reveals the condition of our hearts and tests our motives. So while we wait on God, we shouldn't be obsessing over the growth of the seed we've sown but inviting God to search our hearts. God, God, why aren't you growing this? God, you said if I sow, then you're gonna bless me. Lord, you said if I give to you, then you're gonna give to me in abundance. Where is it? I wanna see it. You start obsessing over the seed growing. You forget that in the season of waiting, instead of obsessing over the seed, you should be going, God, I'm struggling with you starting to doubt this whole harvest you have. God, I'm starting to even wonder where my faith lies when I've for so long sown and seen no success. God, search my heart. Search my heart. Our waiting 
on the seed we've sown is a time of testing to ensure our hearts are prepared to faithfully steward the harvest that God wants to place in our hands. How often do you see men and women of God that we look upon and aspire to and suddenly they, they, they fall? Suddenly, from nowhere, they seem to crumble to the floor and a whole part of their secret life is revealed in which they were grappling with dark areas of themselves which they could never truly embrace. Man, they had lost sight of the need to let God search their hearts. They had got caught up with pursuing the success of harvest. And there would have been periods in which they were waiting, in which instead of focusing on God searching their hearts, they were just driving around ensuring they grew more seed. Our waiting on the seed we have sown is a time of testing to ensure our hearts are prepared to faithfully steward the harvest God wants to place in our hands. And this is why Jesus' words are documented in Luke's gospel, chapter 16, verse 10, that if you are faithful in the little things, then you will be faithful in the large ones. If you are faithful, God, this is hard, I'm suffering, but God, I'm going to faithfully sow seed. If you are faithful here, he will lead you into a season of faithfulness with the greater things. He goes on and says, but if you are dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with the greater responsibilities. Saul was not faithful in waiting on God before going to war. And he therefore would not receive the greater harvest of his legacy as the king over Israel in his future. Our waiting on the seed we've sown is a time of testing to ensure our hearts are prepared to faithfully steward the harvest God wants to place in our hands. So while we wait on God, we shouldn't be obsessing over the growth of the seed we've sown, but inviting God to search our hearts. You see, if you're confused by the struggles that you're facing, even though you've been sowing so faithfully, it may just be because God is testing your heart in preparation so that you can steward the harvest he's going to be placing in your hand. And this is why Paul the Apostle encouraged the early church in the New Testament book of Galatians 6 verse 9 when he said, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. Let's not get tired. God, I've been here for so long. I'm exhausted of waiting on the Lord for his rescue. God, I thought you would have come through on my time by now, that you would have delivered me in my way. Let's not get tired of doing what is good. Then Paul continues, he says, at just the right time, everything is beautiful in his time. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Don't obsess over the growth of the seed you've sown, but invite God to search your heart in preparation for putting the harvest in your hand. Where do you have to work in me, God, so that I have the ability to steward the size of the harvest you want to put in my hands? Where in my heart do I need to grow so that, Lord, I can step into the fullness of the harvest you want to put in my hands? Paul the Apostle writes to the church in in Corinth and he writes about the hearts of a congregation of of the local church in Macedonia and he speaks about their hearts in the midst of suffering while they had been faithful in their sowing. He says, while they were being severely tested by suffering, their overflowing joy along with their extreme poverty has made them even more generous. Generous. See, what Paul was saying was that even though God's people were suffering, because their hearts were right, they didn't stop sowing. Paul was saying even though they are suffering, because of the condition of their hearts, they haven't stopped sowing. Just because you faithfully sow seed doesn't mean you'll avoid struggles. In fact, faithfulness is tested during trials, which means that's what defines us as faithful servants. That's what defines us as faithful servants. 
When we continue to sow, even in our suffering. You see, the goal of faithfulness is not that we will do work for God so that He will work for us, but that He will be free to do His work through us regardless of our circumstances. That's what faithfulness is about. It's not about, okay, God, I'll give you some seed so you can score me on that thing I want. Faithfulness is God. I will sow seed. And I will show you the faithfulness of my heart. Because even when I face the struggles, the suffering of my human experience, I'm not going to stop. I can't see it. I do not know how it's going to grow. But when I can't trace your hand, I choose to trust your heart. The goal of faithfulness is not that we will do work for God so that he works for us, but that he will be free to do his work through us regardless of our circumstances. And there's this mystical, powerful thing that happens in that. You see, it's out of that faithfulness, even in the face of suffering and struggles, that the harvest is then produced. And this is why the psalmist writes in the Old Testament book of Psalm 126, verse 5, that those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. That's why he writes, those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. God didn't promise us that we would avoid suffering just because we faithfully sow seed. As his servants, he promised us joy and abundance if we remained faithful in our sowing through our suffering. So don't stop sowing. Don't give up on the ground you've sown into just because you may be facing struggles or suffering today. You may just be in the season of preparing the heart for what God is going to place in your hands. As Jesus described, the sower in Mark chapter 4, 27, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. I don't know how, God. I don't know how I'm gonna get through the suffering. I don't know why and how I'm going to get through the struggle. I don't know how the harvest is going to be produced through the seed I've sown because all I see is suffering. But even though I don't know, you are the one that makes it grow. And your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. And so as I sow my seed, I stand in expectant hope because I believe in your sovereignty even when things don't make sense. Therefore, the New Testament book of James 5 verse 7 reminds us to be patient then, brothers and sisters. Be patient. Wait in expectant hope even if you're struggling, even if you're suffering. Even if you've sown so much seed, it would not make sense for you to still be in the same place. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. Same way Saul had to wait for Samuel. Be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop. Patiently waiting for the autumn and spring reigns. As you sow, don't lose hope. Because what you're waiting for in frustration is what God is working on as part of your preparation. 